Hi and welcome back to our open stop motion film project. Uh, I did it just wrong, but uh, I forgot to record. Um, the last couple of days I have problem with the sound. It keep uh, shutting off uh, by itself for no reason at all. I don't know why it do it do it and. Uh, or I didn't know but now I know so I have fixed it and we shouldn't have that problem anymore and uh, but you know a lot of time goes to get all of this uh, electronics to work and now I started to print and as you see that didn't end very well my first shot today or just a minute ago this uh, uh, got loose from the, from the from the hot stand where it is on so I uh, have started again so I have to this is a feed for the a comorant I made and um, it's hard to see now but if we take some of this stop off here so now you can see more but uh, I need to print a new one because they have to be longer than this and uh, we are doing that right now and uh, out here you can see and uh, we will I will have to keep a uh, close eye on that because uh, I have to um, put something on there so it stand on the hotbed, but uh, it didn't the first time around. So now we will try again. And the hiss you hear in the background is a blow up. Um, you can see I have made an enclosure to the to the uh, to the three D printer, so we don't have to hear weird uh, noise and music in the background. But uh, I hope everything will go well this time, and uh, I'll keep an eye on it when it goes up in this height here. We can uh, put some uh, uh, some springs on it so it it stands where it has to do. But you know. Sometimes with, with a printer like this, it goes wrong. So uh, it's very difficult to to avoid. It's not. A, I have to see here if okay. It seems to use a lot of a lot of CPU. Uh, it's okay. So. We are printing and we are uh, getting on with this one here and as you can see we have not, uh, I have not gotten very far with that because I have been working a lot on, on the electronics, the, <coughs> the computer to get it to stop. Uh, uh, shutting the mice off last uh, you know we are running this uh, kids workshop also and uh, the last um, episode I made uh, half into the, uh, the show the mice turned off and I wasn't aware of it so the half of the record was there was no uh, there was no sound on so and that's really a bummer when you uh, put a lot of work into it and then of some reason uh, the mic shuts down and that's and what you have done uh, the whole uh, show was 
in vain so but it should be fixed now and we have had a lot of problems lately with uh, first we couldn't uh, uh, send in the uh, stream in the quality I wanted and but that we have fixed and now we have fixed the the my problem and uh, now we have the printer we have to play around with so it's not just to sit down and and uh, hope in everything uh, will work and just make one thing one thing after another and get forward on that way sometimes it's two uh, one step forward and two backwards and, but uh, that we have to live with Keep an eye on this guy here. We need it to stay on the hotbed, or else, or else we have problems. But that's why I, as you see, this one is made on a on this. Uh, cardboard with some uh, textures on it so when I print this out I get this piece with so I the I get a bigger surface on the hotbed when I nowadays but uh, these uh, when I made these uh, scan these uh, feet here I didn't uh, do it and I had a lot of troubles, but I hope today I could do it, but let's see if it goes or not. <clears throat> well, since I have uh, taken, uh, uh, I can show you. with this then I have a much larger surface, surface to stand on and then they are not uh, prone to uh, get up that much as they was before it's very s seldom that they get off now but I haven't done that with these feet so that's why I get in trouble. But if it don't work, I have to put a plate on in the scan but we'll do that later now I will try to fix them to the hotbed when we but I have to get up a little before there are room for the fixtures but Maybe it will go bad before that, and then I will stop and later make uh, a 
better a better scan but I had have made something as you saw oops I hit the mic as you saw I had uh, made a a new uh, intro so we get a little more life in it I will make this uh, uh, these uh, what should we call them shows or net, netcast or whatever I'll make them better over time more interesting but The most important thing here is that I have to get a 3D movie done and not all other stuff. But uh, while I was testing the, the sound and I had to do that over time, then I was making the, the intro. So I didn't waste my time totally. It's a little bit better for every time. I hope. And I apologize, apologize for all the testing on the stream, but uh, I had to do it that way. Because that's the real. The real the only really way to to test it. Or proper way to test it. Because when I when I started the the kids workshop last time all the mic was working and everything was in fine shape until half an hour into the and it cast then the computer decided the best to shut down the mic going in the net to figure out what was wrong if anybody else have had the same experience and a lot had but all of them in a little different way so
see you again. They are still on the platter. <coughs> I have to take a trip out there to see. Looks fine, it's on, on to now. Good. The whole idea with the hotbed on the printer is that that uh, it don't slip, the object don't slip, but it does anyway sometimes. And especially when there is a, not enough, a, not a big enough surface to stand on, of course. We will change the print or the scan, scan of it. Okay. Oh, I haven't made a little, I made these knees to the so we could bend the, the twigs a little and still be stable. More stable than when we use thread a wire like this on the top here. They are not that stable. But today is our episode number 100, so something we have done.
sounds wrong. No. It's okay. You learn to have one ear out by the printer all the time. But it's been a long time since I printed. Because I have waited for a new new extruder to it. And uh, as you probably know, I live in Denmark and I have to have the extruder from US from printable, so it's taken it's take a while before I get here. A bit nervous about the print. But hope oh, I'm lucky. Those who don't have a hotbed use uh, uh, blue uh, masking tape. And that's also but it's not necessary if you have a. But they also sometimes have problem with it breaking loose. On the bed. <clears throat> it's 
when the printer goes from from one foot to the other, it hits uh, if there are little a little point where it hits, then it pushes it off the the bed. It breaks off. See how it goes. My God, it can be frustrating to when you have problems problems with the computer. You cannot figure out how it why it does like, like it does. It's nearly always because the computer, and it was this time too, because the computer want to help you. And you have these weird errors. wanted to help me. This time it was because when I was over a certain volume in the, in the gain on the mic then it shut down. no place where it tells you that it does that and it or it tells you that what what uh, gain you can use turned out that the mic in the workshop I had set too high. And it don't tell you that now I'm shutting something down, it just do it. And then you can, it's up to you to figure out why and how and that's crazy.
but it's always a little tricky when you put analog stuff to computers. They are not always that happy about it. How far we are, or oh, maybe it's already too late. No, I just go and see again if I can. It was already too late. And uh, I couldn't get anything to stick to it. The surface is simply too small to stick to the so it's not bad. So as soon as I touched it then I there was loose again, so we are forgetting that tonight. I had to make, I have to make another s uh, scan, so we can get some more surface to put it on. Because this are not working. Mm. 
And it's hard to get something to squeeze on it because it's kind of sloping, kind of sloping downwards. So there's not much to hold on. No. It has to be a little patient for that one, but uh, oops, it's not. I have found this one. Okay, what is that? Up to <clears throat> maybe we should. I will take uh, yes. And So clean them a little again. So it sticks. I don't think <coughs> so I think that the uh, water based Glue sticks that good to to boom, and then some matchsticks to put 
in there. Boop, 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 boop. Someday we will fire the cameraman because she is not doing a good job. Take a couple of cotton sticks, or what you would call them, so we can get so we will let it be a little while.
need that shot. <coughs> and we don't use that much CPU. Oh, maybe we do that anyway. Tomorrow we have to build. Tomorrow, when is it? I always take the wrong mice. Tomorrow, it is. Uh, okay. Tomorrow, 3 p.m. my time. <coughs> we are <coughs> carrying on with our dollhouse. So that. We can get on to the finer details. But next week I'm not here. Next week I have I, uh, I have Easter vacation. And I hope I can get out and take some pictures. <clears throat> My cameras are getting dusty. My youngest son will keep an eye on things and 
change episode uh, rerun episodes so it will not be the same for a whole week so he have borrowed the studio while I'm away guess he will make any trees or something like that or <laughs> animals to the forest enough to do. So I can come back with fresh energy and maybe some good ideas to how I can make it more interesting. I have, a, I have some, but the problem is always that. Not have it to take too much time from this. We will never get it done.
Hm. Need to have the shape right. We cannot have it being thicker up and thinner down. That's not the way it works. Reboard. into it. Fingernails. Thin a little thin down here. Okay. That was 
Better, at least in that side. And when I get back from Easter holiday, I need to start to experiment with how how to get leaves on without glue them on one leaf at a time. There must be a way. some ideas but the need to stand the test and that's not sure I will But it has been a long, long way to get to here, uh, to number 100, building the studio and
coming up uh, with all sorts of crazy solutions on how to do things to try to keep it to a budget but I didn't quite manage the budget thing but the heck Cannot get everything. Someone is have made a mess around here, and it's not me. We have gotten a lot of stuff done. Even that one sometimes think that I don't get anywhere. But uh, That's mostly when the computers and stuff will not work. Then you feel that you're wasting your time.
<clears throat> I was hoping for the printer to run tonight. do it tomorrow but it's a little difficult I am getting my granddaughter from the kindergarten one o'clock my time tomorrow so And with a six-year-old in the house, then it's not always easy to be efficient. But it's fun, though.
I get many good stories from her. It's great to be able to go and get her midday. And see her waiting just inside the fence. Somehow she knows what time it is and when I come. Even she don't know the watch. And don't have any. And she's six and he, he she even have a boyfriend. That's something. said hello to him too. It is starting to look a little, a little like
<clears throat> so you coffee. This is cold. Somehow it always get cold. Maybe it's because I forget to drink it. That could be. I don't know, but it is a possibility. get a little symmetry. Maybe we should hear what the now that I sit here alone, hear what the boys in, and girls in Twit live, you know, those guys. People abuse you. Yeah, carrot fit. See, this is what I need, the seven minute workout, but with some yeah. snark. Yeah, yeah. I like no, it. No, it's just refreshing. I mean, a lot of stuff is bland or, or like Serenity said, perfunctory, and he's got some attitude and carrot that comes hunger. A talking calorie counter. And that was free. That's they have uh, Matt you, Break you know, Weekly like now. On Twit Live. Um my I like the one that is showing me right now. What's it say? But, oh, now is the winter of our disco tent. <laughs> okay, I'm this downloading a picture of right there on that. Yeah. <laughs> what do I get in the tough love uh, bundle? What is oh I see that's the three of them uh, together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I should yeah. probably do that. Same oh, it doesn't include different. weather. Darn it. You're a dirty little piggy. Dirty little piggy should be outside so the rain will wash them out, dirty little piggy. Yes, I'm a dirty little piggy. I am, I am. I'm sorry. Um, Get out no, of here. Five more dollars right now. <laughs> My actual pick of the week is something I sadly can't talk very much about because it's embargoed until tomorrow morning. You know, you I stole this. I knew you were going to do this. I We argued about it last week, and I figured if I put it in there really quickly, I'd get away with it. Dang you. So, again, I, I, I can't tell you anything about it except that I've been using it through the beta period and I like it a lot. Uh, Fantastical 2 is what I'm talking about. Fantastical 1 has been my go-to calendar on iOS and Mac uh, since it came out. Fantastical 2 is you know a, a reimagining re of what it means to be Fantastical, similar to what Fantastical 2 was on iOS, just in the context of, of the Mac. It comes out tomorrow, it's by Flexbits. Um, and it's 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 really good. So as sometime tomorrow it'll magically appear on the app store and a bunch of news outlets will write about it and tell you all about it. But I'll just say that if you if you care at all about getting stuff into uh, a calendar fast and getting it out of the calendar fast, you're gonna really want to check out Fantastic Cal. It's a great team and it's a great app. I don't know anything. Uh, about uh, I know, I'm trying to be really careful here. I so sneeze. Well, I was kinda of mad because we gotta we gotta talk to Simmons about uh. this. <laughs> He's got to make it Tuesday, right? Tuesday would be better. Just saying. I know. If you do it Wednesday, we're probably not going to mention it the following Tuesday. Just saying, yeah. All it's you ask, Tuesday. It's a risky thing. I got well, the thing is, like, like, for the App Store, Thursday is a sweet slot because that's when Apple does their features. Uh, so if you if, if they ask you to go on a Thursday, you, you're going to want to do that. But I kind of think that otherwise, you <clears throat> if you can't get Apple, you should definitely try it. 
Good to know. I got two picks. Uh, I'll do them, I'll do them uh, quick because they're not that interesting. Uh, the first one is uh, from Instagram. Has and a if app, any uh, one of you don't know to uh, the Twitch live oh, here it is. Lay out netcast <laughs> with Leo Laporte. Which will take all your pictures. If you have any pictures on your phone, of course, all the guys. Uh, yeah, and I will should just suggest to it's you to really nice. it's very simple to use to uh, you just select the pictures you want if you are tech you interested nice then, then that's these guys are flip things around the best around, around after my uh, and then, opinion uh, it will give you a chance the address is tweet and post it on Instagram dot, of course, it's from Instagram no no live dot tweet dot TV what's cool about this is I hope Instagram does more stuff. They did That's Hyperlope a really as well. good. They're good developers. It's iOS only, but they're good developers. Really like good podcast. It's very simple. Lots of people already have. Well, a lot of different. Uh, you don't need another one. Probably. Uh, but uh, I thought it. I thought stop it. Stop it. The other one. I, I know you guys. I know at least you Windows were there, so Weekly so and fan. Mac Break Weekly mm, and, and we were having the heck of TNT. A time in the house. Take uh, news the tonight. We have sy- several with systems spread out. Elgin and and uh, Mike Elgin and the system and, uh, the farthest away from the Sonos. Uh, a bridge would constantly die. A lot of stuff. What Sonos does, which is bad, now, this really got bad when they added this new ability to not have a bridge, but to do it all via Wi-Fi. I have followed Sonos has Leo its own for kind of years. Mesh style network that really works. The advantage Sonos has over any other solution is everything's in sync. I don't know how it does it. So if you turn on all the speakers into party mode, everything sounds the same. You don't get weird d- delays and echoes throughout the house. It's fabulous. Uh, lots of other good reasons to like Sonos. They came out with a solution that has fixed my problem, and I wanted to tell people who, if you're having trouble with Sonos speakers losing track of where they belong or suddenly becoming Wi-Fi, they, you, and the symptom of that is is you you lose you suddenly you don't you don't have a system or part of the system disappears. <coughs> this is a great solution, and Sonos should have done this ages ago. This is a Wi-Fi, basically a Wi-Fi access spot called the Sonos Boost. It's not very expensive. I think it's a hundred bucks. And uh, what it does is it has three antennas. It's like a massive, massive Wi-Fi adapter. You plug this into your router via Ethernet, and everything else can be unplugged. That's how Sonos generally works. And this really solved our problem. So if you've had problems with Sonos that was because you have it spread out or, you, or there's uh, Internet getting in the way, uh, which is another problem because we have a lot of Wi-Fi going around, um, the boost is well worth it fixed our problem. Now we had the similar problems here in the studio and it did not solve our problem here. But I think if but that's I think we have a different issue with interference. If your issue is that your stuff is spread out a lot, the boost really fixed it. And I put it basically in the same location that the uh, Sonos Connect was, so it, it's 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 demonstrably better at, at creating the network than the Sonos Connect is. We're out of time, but we are not out of wonderful people. I want to thank Serena and Caldwell from iMore.com for being here. Always a pleasure. Is the snow melting? Is it melting? Is spring uh, coming? Yeah. Supposedly it's going to be in the 50s next week, this mm. week. Fingers crossed. I'm hoping for you. Maybe. If not, I still believe in spring. <laughs> you know you can always come out here. I know. 80 degrees okay. this weekend. Just saying. It's actually beautiful today. It's a gorgeous day, isn't it? If only you're not, you know, slowly sinking into drought. Oh, that. Oh, there won't be any water. No, you don't need, you don't need water. I like my showers. No, no, no. Sorry. You don't want to come here then. You're, this is the place where you shower with a friend to save water. Uh, we, there are lots of other bumper stickers, but I won't, I won't continue. Uh, Mr. Renee Ritchie, I'm more.com. Nice to have you. Montreal is, is, is it, is it uh, patio weather? So Leo, it went up to one degree Celsius, and I opened my window just because I wanted some fresh air. I fell asleep, and then I woke up, and it was minus 25 with wind chill. My iPhone felt like it had uh, liquid nitrogen poured on it. There was frozen condensation on my table, and I'm not leaving my house again till June. I saw your post. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> I felt so bad for you. Jeez Louise. Uh, great to have you, Renee. Always, Renee uh, does a great podcast. Actually, Serenity also does great podcasts. The incomparable Renee's debug is a must listen for anybody who's a Mac fan. Uh, all of that you'll find at imore.com, and you'll find uh, Serenity's podcast at theincomparable.is.net. Uh, the incomparable, I believe, dot com okay. is uh, is ours. Just, yeah, the no, incomparable. Nobody com. types net or com anymore. They just type into the Google the incomparable. And click the link. Show me the incomparable. Yes. That's all you need. 
Andy and Ako is at the Chicago Sun Times. Always a thrill. You're the best. Best sideburns in technology. Thank you for being here. Best in technology. I'd have to argue with that. Sideburns and technology. Now that Asimov is very much not with us anymore, I'll, I, I, I could be talked out of that, but I'll, I'll, it's not ridiculous. You know who gave you a run for your money recently? Joaquin Phoenix, the uh, the last movie he did, the rat, what was it called? Uh, it's the one based on the Pynchon novel. Yeah. He plays a 1970s detective, stoner detective. He was, he was, he was, he was rocking it. Actually, now that I think of it, Bert Rutan uh, has uh, nice sideburns and also as the CEO of Scaled Composites, I probably have to say that the, the makers of uh, low orbit, uh, low, low, uh, low altitude spacecraft, I have to say, probably more tech savvy than I. But. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody's more tech savvy than you. The movie was Inherent Vice, yes. and uh, and uh, he plays a character named Larry Doc Sportello, and has cyborgs, much like. I don't. I I don't want to brag, but you know, if your phone iPhone is having problems, I think I could probably fix it before you can. <laughs> hey, thanks for uh, being here, you guys. Thank you all for watching the show. We do it every uh, every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific. It's 2 p.m. Eastern time. 1800 UTC on live.twit.tv but if you can't watch live on demand audio and video always available after the fact twit.tv slash mbw but better than that subscribe use a overcast or some podcast app or iTunes whatever you need make sure you get every episode you don't want to miss one and we appreciate it when you subscribe that way we know you'll be here each and every Tuesday for Mac Break Weekly thanks now get back to work because break time is over everybody Thank you guys. I'm sorry you're not feeling well, uh, Serenity. I hope you feel better. Me too. Hopefully, I'm fingers crossed this is almost over. Although I managed to do most of this at my new standing desk, so I feel pretty pumped about that. Oh, you're standing. Yeah, well, I'm standing sitting. <laughs> I have a I have a stool that I've been like kind of leaning on. I think, but... I think sitting on a high stool isn't really standing. No, I mean, I was standing for half of the show, and then I had the stool uh, nearby just in case you, I... Uh, you were the <laughs> two-hour marathon. Yes, exactly. Short by last time standing. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was fun. I have to say, and then we had lunch afterwards. Yeah, that was great. Mm -hmm. The Meerkat. In studio, so. hilarity. Yes. Yeah, I should mention that the uh, founder of Meerkat, Ben Rubin, will be on uh, Triangulation next week, which will be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, so, nice. We thought we'd get him while he's still... <laughs> no, on top of the world right? wandering around yeah <laughs> uh, awesome yeah, before he buys the sub thank you everybody see you guys take care bye bye, bye, bye. bye. it's bye, a guys. leaning desk they're right it's a leaning desk that's what it is uh name suggestions Mr. I have, chat room I have three okay uh, Voltron executives <laughs> I like that the champagne gold room of okay. the champagne room uh fart adjacent but I don't think that's going to make it. Fart adjacent will not make it. <laughs> I'd like the champagne room. The champagne. Huh? Or that. Pantry moths. I have not, Dr. Mom. I didn't forget that. I don't have to have it anymore. Jennifer has it. Sources and sauces. Was it Was it Milanese loop? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Milanese loop. <coughs> Steve Gibson coming up with episode 500 of Security Now. I like pantry moths. <laughs> this is Mac Break Weekly, episode 447, recorded Tuesday, March 24th, 2015. Pantry moths. That's right, peyote beadwork. <clears throat> Backbreak Weekly is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price. Because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash MacBreak and enter the promo code MacBreak. And by Legals.
have two. Mm-hmm. What's your name? Brian. Nice Brian. to meet you, Brian. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. You deserve some nice treats. There's good lunch places here I can talk to. Probably not. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's your brick set? Yeah, I have, and I'm just trying to remember. You know, there's 1,800 of them. I'm trying to remember where it is. I can never remember. You find it. You'll find it. Oh, yeah, I see I see somebody who's dying for ice cream. All right, guys, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Take care. Nice to meet you. I would like some delicious food. How about uh, the Niçoise salad? I think that's the healthiest option, isn't it? Yeah. All right, going to move in there because we got an episode 500 of Security now. Security Thank you. Sorry. I. Mm, you're gonna love Lala's. That's all I can say. Best ice cream ever. Well, this computer seems now that it's settled, seems to be operating quite nicely. So I'm gonna take a chance to just close it. That's what it was causing problems with. And get on over to the studio. Walk on over to the other side.
kiss today goodbye. <laughs> Do -do 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 -do. Hello, Steve Reno. Yo, Leo. Episode 500. Five double zero. Double lot. <laughs> Title is Windows Secure Boot. Secure Boot. Oh, good. Very interested in that subject. Yeah, I know. I've heard you and Paul talking about it yeah. for years, and I figured we'd do the technical side of Extremely it. Extremely interested in that. Since WinHack in uh, China four days ago scared a lot of people, oh. uh, there was a slide there, which uh, I, I have the link in the show notes. You'll want to bring it up when it's time. Which uh, this might represent a change in Microsoft policy such that it may not be necessary to make it optional any longer which uh, oh, has yeah. interesting consequences. Yeah, that of course got a lot of people uh, upset, Linux users and so forth upset. Um, but you can disable in BIOS. Are you saying they're thinking of turning the ability to disable in BIOS off? Yes. Uh, the, in fact, the, the slide says it's OEM option whether to allow end user to turn off secure boot. Yeah. Well, sorry, I, I just won't buy, the, ever buy a machine that can do that. And I think that'll be if the, if if it actually happens. Well, I think it, it, it may segment the market into yeah, sort of some people will want that. Con yeah, consumerish sort of right. you know turnkey. Well, for example, it's you can't turn it off in mobile phone. So the, you know the mobile platform has is absolutely right. undisableable. So it sort of differentiates the market. But right. we, we we never discussed what it is. So I thought we'd just Good. do a, a nice technical dive and do U E F I. Uh, firmware and how that all works. Love that. Well, there you go. Windows Secure Boot, March 24th, 2015, episode 500. And thank you, by the way, for the celebratory cap. You're very, very welcome. Nice. I hope it's good. We, we've had, uh, we've really liked Robert, Robert Craig for a while. Cool. And, I'll uh, be trying it over the weekend. Good. Sure. Yeah, let me know what you think. Yeah. <laughs> I found a new favorite wine, but I found it in a very, uh, surprising way. Did you hear that story? I don't think so. <laughs> we were in Vegas. You know, it's Debbie's, it was Debbie's 50th. We had a very lovely time. Brought Debbie and her husband. Lisa and I went to Vegas uh, on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, no, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of last week. And uh, uh, the first meal on uh, Wednesday night, we wanted to take them to a nice place, uh, or Thursday night. So we went to uh, uh, Michael Minna restaurant uh, called Bardo. I think that okay. was in the, I can't remember where that, which hotel that was in. Um, but I misread the menu. I, I, Lisa and I wanted a bottle of oh, just a half bottle. It was just the two of us. Yeah. And uh, so we're looking on the half bottles. And I had it was a good wine list. I had seen some fairly expensive wines, and I saw a half bottle of a Bordeaux. We love Bordeaux, but it was a Bordeaux I hadn't tried that I'd heard good things about. Right. Aubryon, H A U T B R I O N. And I could have sworn when I'm looking at it, I thought, oh, this is really expensive. It was $111 for a split for a little bottle. But not occasion. untouchable for a special not occasion. Nice glass for each of you. Yeah, that was $11. Oh! And uh, no I missed kidding. the zero. And then, so we got the uh, yeah. bill, and I said, wow. And I looked down and said, whoa. So I went over and I said, I asked the sommelier. I, and then the maitre d'. I said, you know, I, I know we drank it. We'll buy, we'll buy it if we have to, but is that correct? It's the menu. Yeah, it's correct. <laughs> and I looked at it. But I have to say, it Very was nice. really good. And we even even we, as we were drinking it, not knowing how good it was, and I think we might have drank it a little slower. If we yeah, were. this is worth a hundred bucks. But even we were saying, wow, this is really good. We this is our. It might be my new favorite wine. But boy, uh, now remember they mark it up. Not I, well, I was going to say, I and I have a problem paying a, a crazy amount of money. Restaurants, food. restaurants. It's just, yeah. you know, it's just, it's gone. Yeah. Somehow it's just. See, like I don't anything. because here's my feeling. I like spending money on experiences as opposed to things. I don't need more things. Yep. yep. But I, but yeah. I want to, and I want to have experiences with Lisa, and yep. and my kids, and you know. But and so, uh, you know, uh, to me, could travel incredible restaurants it's worth it because even though yeah it's gone but well, you, you have, have the memories and I'm, you know, yeah. we're just married we want to create some memories so yeah. Yeah. 
That's a memory. <laughs> I won't forget that memory. Let, get, get, put the bottle up there next to your lens. Jeez. <laughs> well, you can bet that I'll, that I'll be very careful from now on when I look at the exactly. prices. And, and, when, and when you looked at, at back at the menu, there what, there was the extra zero. I mean, it was like... Yeah, but you don't expect in the half bottles to see a thousand dollar bottle. You know, and I think that was it. Exactly. Your, your brain just didn't parse it. Because yeah. it's like, nah, it's like, it sort of rejected it. It's like, yeah. nah, that's can't be, can't that be. Couldn't be. That couldn't be. That wouldn't, that makes no sense. So I, I can remember looking at it and seeing $111. I knew how much the wine cost. Um, so, you know, I remember that. Uh, because I'm thinking, that's a lot, but you know what? I, I, this looks really good. I really want to try it. And the, and, uh, the sommelier, when we ordered it, said, oh, good choice. <laughs> he could have said, you know, you, for $500 more, you can get a whole bottle. He should have said now, something. This, this does put me in mind if you watch shopping, because he, you be know, doing he, that. Might have, he might have asked you for a credit report. Well, you, that's why we uh, were talking about this in, during Mac Break Weekly. Is how right, do you right. how do you without insulting somebody hint? You don't even need a hint. You just you know, it's an expensive bottle. Are you sure you want that? <laughs> he could you have know, said something I, like, you know, I know it's such an expensive bottle, but boy, it really is a wonderful wine. Because even then, that I would have thought, yeah, you're right, 111 bucks. That's expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, probably in the Apple Store case, it is also a function of the store's location. <laughs> Because you, yeah. you, you know, in, 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 on Wilshire Boulevard, you're going to get people coming in in sandals who, you know, who park their Lamborghini around the corner or, or, or like, you know, their driver is waiting next to it around the corner right. because, you know, just because they can. And by the way, people are saying, oh, you got suckered. Um, of course, the first thing we did as we left was we looked up this wine. It's just really that expensive. It is that expensive. Well, it's that, not that restaurants mark it up two or three times what it yes. costs, but it's five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars a bottle for the year that we had, maybe more. Yeah. So it wasn't it was and it, you know you, I was gonna say you, you know my strategy. I buy it and wait for ten years. I have a storage facility right. and and so I buy it when it's you well, know, this was like, two thousand six. So it was a little young on the young side for a Bordeaux, but not but certainly drinkable and it was. Yeah. Oh my God. It was incredible. You know that done None of the weirdness okay, of the yeah. done. It was just beautiful. This so beautiful. straight up. But anyway, I feel like an idiot. <sighs> okay. And it, actually, you know, it is too bad you didn't know the price since you were already we would have committed. Appreciated you might as well have, yes, you might as well have known the price right. while you were while you were drinking it because it would have tasted that much better. Well, I have to say, credit to Lisa and, and me, I think we as we tasted it, we said, wow, this is remarkable. I mean, I, we, we knew we were drinking a really good, a remarkably good wine. Because we like Bordeaux. We've tasted a lot of Bordeaux. So, it was it was obvious that we were drinking an exceptional wine. Yeah, it's hard to buy for, it's hard for me to buy wine now, nice wine in a restaurant because of the crazy price. Oh. You know, as I, as I said, I, I buy a bottle for maybe $45 and then sit on it for yeah. seven years and, and age it. So it's about ten years old, and at that point, you're, you know, it, it is a two or three hundred dollar bottle. Oh yeah, it goes up it, if you could buy it. And yeah. uh, well, that's the other thing you can't because they take them off. The no, market. you can't exactly. They're so they're they're really, such a clever, really good wine seller, clever yeah. business. Yeah, and by the way, that's why I'll be buying the Apple Sport Watch <laughs> next month instead of. And I'm really kind of second thinking that uh, MacBook, you know. I won't be buying that. You're going to get that, though, so I want to watch you closely. Yeah, and I'm going to wait on the watch. I, I remember the anger at the second version of the iPhone when yeah. it was a lot nicer. And the, uh, yeah. you and I were in Vancouver, and yeah. we were discussing this the, 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 the collapse in price. Yeah. And and the, the justification was, well, the early adopters who really wanted to have that iPhone they had, you know, they paid for the privilege of being first. Yeah. And now comes, you know, the masses. Of course, I was still happily typing away on my BlackBerry. Right? <laughs> you know, I just continued that for 10 years until I finally switched Maybe over. Maybe you'll have a few Apple Watches in the freezer in years to come. I'll, uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it, it'll, be fun, it'll be fun to see how, it, how well, what you think and how it goes. But to me, it just doesn't feel like a need as much. So yeah. we'll see. 
All right, we have, uh, I think, but one ad, and it's a Harry's. Ah, okay, so that's good. Check our lower third. I am freshly, I am freshly, freshly shaven. Hour, hours ago, I am hairy eyes. De-hairy eyes. De-hairied. De-hairied. And I am back to the cream. I really do. That, that cream I like the cream. It's something, yeah. I, I really, I, I feel like that's the best way to go. The complaints I've seen about it are that it clogs the razor, but I, I, I've not had that problem. But I've used well, creams for a thick. long time. It, it, it is thick. That's why so, you want it. Yeah. I'm just cleaning up a little bit here. <laughs> All right. It's time for Security Now, the show where we cover your security online, and we couldn't do it without this guy right here, the explainer-in-chief Steve Gibson of GRC.com. Hi, Steve. Leo, episode 500. Oh, my goodness. Now, some people, uh, notably Simon Zarafa, who's tweeted several times, saying, well, what, if, what, what about 512? You know, shouldn't oh, that be binary like bigot thing? It's like, well, okay, yeah, that's going to be good in 18 weeks. But right now, episode 500. So. Well, you know what it does? It points up the fact that this is really just an odometer number. There's not really much. I mean, if, when you say we've been doing this show for 10 years, now that's meaningful to me. Right. Right. And that's well, coming it, exactly very because soon. because because you have some of your daily shows that are in the triple or yeah. what, in, the, in the four four digits Gizwiz already. Is, yeah, so. Chris is in thousands. But yeah, but but our 10th anniversary. Do you know? Have you have we figured out when that is? Because that's. In, in six months or so, I think. I think it, it was shorter after Twit. I think we started Security Now, mm, like in the late summer. Okay, so so yeah, soon. Maybe about six months. Yeah. Yeah, because our Twit, we're April nineteenth, will be our uh, ten yep. anniversary Twit. That's gonna be a fun event. Nice. We've got all the original uh, guys on the show, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. So that's a special this yep. week at Tech on April nineteenth. So. This week, I, I was I was sort of moved to this topic because of some news that came out of uh, Microsoft's WinHEC, uh, the hardware engineering conference in Shenzhen, China, about four days ago. And a slide that was shown talking about the UEFI secure boot and TPM details caught a lot of people's attention because under UEFI Secure Boot, in order to get the Windows 10 logo, which is, you know, the, the prized, what everyone wants to have on their laptops so that they can say, you know, we're an official Windows 10 logo laptop or desktop or whatever, um, you must ship the machine with Secure Boot enabled. Yeah. You must have UEFI version 2.31 or later, which is, and 2.31 is when Secure Boot essentially happened. So it sort of appeared in 2.2, but 3.1 is now, is like the, 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 the standard. Then they said, uh, for Windows 10 Mobile, must not allow Secure Boot to be turned off on the retail device. Well, that's not a biggie. That's sort of like the iPhone. You don't want the iPhone's boot integrity to be, you can't turn, you're not supposed to be able to turn that off. You know, it's an appliance. So the Win 10 Mobile is an appliance in that sense. But what what generated a ton of news stories when people saw Oops. this is that for Win 10 don't. Desktop for the first time, they said it's the OEM's option whether to allow the end user to turn off secure boot. Now, this is a, if this stands, and this is a change by the time it finally happens, late, um, you know, this what summer, for some time, but this is a policy change from Win 8, because Win 8 also used UEFI secure boot, had to ship with it enabled. However, in order to get the Logo we have certification here. for Win 8, the OEM had to allow the end user to turn it off and had to allow them to add their own security certificates to the 
the UEFI Secure Boot database. So, so this sort of, I mean, this is sort of always been Microsoft's approach. Is, for example, in XP, they added a firewall, and this was still when the market was selling third-party firewalls. But oh, not to worry, it's off by default. And sure enough, it really didn't affect anyone because it was off by default. But then, of course, famously with Service Pack 2, they turned it on. And so Microsoft sort of creeps along like this. Anyway, so the, the issue is um, that if you were to purchase a machine which, which the OEM Keeps it in my night names in it. the opportunity to yes. disable secure boot in the BIOS, then that's a Windows appliance. You can't put Linux on it. You can't yeah. do anything else with you don't it that own you it, may, really. that you may not, want to. It's not yours. Well, it's sort of more like a big flat phone, yeah. because you know, in that sense. So anyway, th this stirred up a bunch of of commotion, and I thought this is a perfect opportunity for us on Security Now to look at the technology of the UEFI. What's that about? What's Secure Boot? What, how, how how does Windows interact with it? And and down at the technical level, with certificates and hashes and all that, how does that all work? So that's the topic for the show today, Windows Secure Boot. Excellent. Uh, and there was a little bit of news, uh, a really a perfect teachable moment for an iPhone, iPad, four-digit pin hack. Uh, I just loved the cleverness of this, so we'll talk about that. Another an even worse certificate was found in the wild than we talked about last week. Um, and I've heard you now, both on MacBreak Weekly and on Twit, talk about the Pwn to Own contest, uh, which I thought was just amazing because, you know, that kid who cracked all the browsers probably could n name his salary. Actually, yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't need a salary. Yeah. $255,000 he won. Yeah. yeah. So we have a great podcast today. Excellent. I'm excited. I hope you are too, since it is, after all, our 500th, and Lisa and I uh, wish you a very happy 500th, and uh, our deepest prayer Oops. to another 500 for us. <laughs> and it's going great for me. I, I ought to also mention, just because we won't be talking uh, again until after, uh, I turn 60 in two days. Happy birthday! So, well, that's a big yep. one. I hope you're doing something fun. That, well, I've got all kinds of plans. So <laughs> well, that's a huge birthday. Like, wow. Yeah, and I guess what I like about it is that it was it was as I was approaching my five o ten years ago that uh, I I had I just published Spinrite Six. It was cruising along, uh, and I got I got sort of as I was approaching fifty, I got focused on health. And so that's when I really began my dive into learning about supplements and longevity and health and inflammation and got into the whole issue of heart disease and cholesterol and, of course, famously vitamin D and then later the whole ketosis thing and all that. And for me, as I turned 60, what's, what's exciting for me is that I can literally, I, I can truly say that I feel 10 years younger today than I did 10 years ago. Like, I mean, I just, I, I've never felt better in my life. We, we saw that I got a, a cold a couple of weeks ago, so <laughs> I'm not impervious, but I, I just, you know, nothing hurts. I wake up feeling fantastic. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to do some scans on the day after my birthday. I, I like to get my carotid artery ultrasound scanned. That I did remove a little bit of plaque about five years ago uh, that was initially there when I began this quest for health, and that's all gone now. I reversed that, and wow, uh, right. anyway, I'm just having a great time. So 6-0, and it does feel like a milestone. And oh, I'm yeah. Just, I'm Glad that everything's going so well. Or as Web you know, three four says, it's only thirty two in hex. <laughs> That's Just right. Remember that. That's right. Although I don't want to know what it is in binary. Yeah. I'm sorry, he's got it wrong. It's four C. Four Charlie. Four Charlie. <laughs> um. Well, you are well shaved. I might add that for your uh, for your anniversary show and. 
We can thank Harry's for that. I have my Harry's kit right here. Harry's uh, early on. Uh, they're I think they're two years old, so they're just kids. When they started, they did a little investigation. What they wanted to do was offer a better shaving experience, something we do every single day. And uh, as uh, well, I almost said as men, but as humans, I guess. And uh, many of us do every single day. And it's often something we don't look forward to. But Harry's has changed all that for so many of us by giving us a fun, great shave at a very affordable price. When they decided to start Harry's, they, that was the, the, the challenge, was how do, we make, how do we make a better blade for less money? And uh, the founders actually found out that the best blades in the world are made uh, by two factories. No. Both in Germany. So they bought one of them. I put the thing on the ground. Or oh, more lost it. Oop. Yep. Hey, <laughs> I had to hit the mic so I could see if it was on. Just for precaution. Always a little difficult. Always to get in between here without putting your names into it. reload we kind of fall off we kind of fall off a little or fell
Hmm. <coughs> oh, jeez. Sorry. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
just last week the really interesting hack with live.fi where Microsoft had not blocked all of the administrative email am, account names I am listening to you to might use tweet to authenticate live broadcast and as a consequence an enterprising person in Finland said hey uh I have, what was it? Hostmaster at live. Dot fi. He got, he set up an, that is dot an TV. To his otherwise live. And the program is named Security now. The Steve Gibson and Leo Laporte. Well, it turns out there was another instance of that that was a little less reported, and that was somebody also did the same thing at live. Dot be, which was another one of these Microsoft properties, but just in a different top-level domain. But uh, the big news of the week, which caused Chrome to immediately reissue uh, and update their CRL set. Remember, I was talking about how, in fact, it was two weeks. It was it was last week, and I'm looking up at my CRL set monitor here, which was at nine. Okay. And you'll remember that I'm entry number five. You know, revoked.grc.com <laughs> is I'm 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 at five. And since then, there have been a few other problems, but but live.fi was nine because we they added nine, and I imagine that live.be was ten, and then something even worse was eleven because they're now up to eleven of these explicitly blocked certificates. It seems so few. Um, well, it it you know it is because um, because. These are the ones which are not yet expired. So there have been horrible problems in the past, but th those certificates have now expired themselves just by their date. So that's one of the nice things. I mean, it, you know, I remember years ago grumbling about the need to constantly be issuing certificates, how, how they expired, and it was just a it was a, a money making enterprise for the, the certificate authorities. I have a much I think, of, and I know that our audience does now too, a more sophisticated and mature understanding of the fact that, yeah, you know, that's maybe not ideal, but it's the best solution we have. Because if certificates weren't expiring, that list, which you note is so short, could not be that short. Because every certificate that had ever had this problem would have to be on that list. Now it's only those that haven't otherwise expired themselves. So this is, you know, <coughs> this is that trade-off that, that we make, where we really don't have a perfect system. And the event that occurred, which caused the eleventh entry in that table, is another biggie. It turned out, and, I, and we have to thank Google for this. I mean, one of the neatest things about Chrome is that Google has pinned all of the Google certs, which is to say cr the Chrome browser knows the serial numbers of every legitimate Google certificate, meaning that you can, you can forge other people's certs. You cannot forge Google certs Bec and, and look at them with the Chrome browser. The Chrome browser will have a fit just instantly and it immediately you know has instrumentations sending alarms back to cupertino and and you know immediately <coughs> Mount, immediately Other google knows <laughs> right, immediately google knows that that they that one of their browsers somewhere in the world has just encountered a fraudulent google certificate and that happened again last week it's happened several times it's how we find out about these things so quickly is somebody messes with chrome and chrome just it's finicky this way so what it turns out happened was china's cnnic that's the china internet network information center which is a large chinese mm -hmm. authority under an agreement with a with an egyptian intermediate certificate authority called MCS Holdings, uh, CNNIC issued MCS Holdings an intermediate certificate that had signing authority, meaning that that, that certificate 
had the bits set in it that allowed it to sign other certs. This was an error. Uh, this, well, th th okay, so, th 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 uh, <laughs> um, the agreement was that MCS Holdings would only issue certificates for their own domains. Instead, they broke their agreement with CNNIC, which is the root certificate authority that all of our browsers trust. I mean, this is like this is the equivalent of the Hong Kong Post Office. This is, you know, this is CNNIC is a CA, a root certificate authority that all browsers trust. So their self-signed certificate is in all of our OSs and phones. So that is that China, really Nick? Is that what that is? Yes. Yes. So, 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 this CNNIC issued a an intermediate certificate that itself could be used to sign other certs to this MCS Holdings, this Egyptian intermediate certificate authority, with the promise from MCS Holdings that they would only use it to sign their own domains. Instead. They installed it in a proxy. Whoa. So, so what they did was they stuck it in a piece of equipment that was then able to filter all of the traffic moving through it. Now we've we've we recently we talked about this a lot because of course this is what some of the spyware that we've been talking about recently has been doing. But they didn't have a a certificate that could sign other certs. So what, what th that is a certificate that was chained to a root cert that everybody already trusted. That's what's different about this. MCS Holdings had this certificate that could sign other certs and it was trusted by the, the, the root cert that we all use. Mm -hmm. Normally when you want a proxy, like when the spyware is proxying, they have to install their public key um, in your browser in order for you to trust what they signed with their private key. But but by installing, and this is the reason MCS Holdings presumably did this, was they put this certificate in a proxy so that, so that everybody downstream of the proxy would trust all of the security and they'd be, they'd be Cracking open, basically performing a man in the middle okay. attack, cracking open secure transactions for whatever reason they had. But somebody inside of that network had Chrome. And the, the, moment, the moment they went to a Google property, the Chrome browser received a fraudulent Google cert from this proxy appliance and raised holy hell wow. and immediately, you know, exposed the fact that something was generating these fraudulent certificates. Google got on it, figured out what was going on, and has blacklisted that cert. Um, Firefox will be updated. Um, I got a, a, a couple updates from Firefox. There was, there was a Firefox update. I think we're at like 33 point so, let me take a look here. Let's see where I am. They said it's going to oh. ship in Firefox 37. Ah, right. So I'm at 36.0.4. Uh, one of those, you know, one of those changes was to fix the pwn to own vulnerability. We're going to talk about next. Um, but you're right. In 37, they will they will push out a Firefox that has this intermediate cert uh, untrusted. At much as Chrome now has, thanks to the CRL set. Now, the interesting so, thing, the Mozilla Security Blog points out that the CNN NIC, the China CN NIC, the China NIC, uh, said, as you said, that it wasn't permitted by their uh, policies and practices, and have revoked the intermediate certificate. But this is why right. this is an issue because we, as we know, certificate revocation is Does basically work. meaningless. Yes. So they have to add it yeah. to the list, that 11-member list, which includes Steve, of certificates <laughs> you should not trust. Firefox does right. the same thing. But that's if certificate revocation worked, this would have been automatic. And 
It's kind exactly. of annoying. Exactly, and, and, and yes, and this is, you know, this is where I c- kind of went off on my complete tirade many months ago when I realized that, that Chrome was misrepresenting their own CRL set because they're having to manually, manually revoke high, highly important certificates by adding it to a special list at the top because their CRL set isn't actually big enough to, to really do much good. And, 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 and the, the, this highlights again the, 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 essentially the problem that we talked about last week, which is it is we have currently a brittle system. It's brittle because a tiny mistake that any one of the hundreds of certificate authorities that we implicitly trust, a tiny mistake they make requires a scramble. Suddenly, all of the browsers and and other trust uh, anchors that exist on the internet have to scramble in order, you know, to deal with the the, the event of a tiny mistake being made. So this, I mean, it's just not stable the way it is. And the good news is there are things on the horizon uh, that are going to probably fix this. Interestingly, so. Mozilla has introduced, we will introduce with 37, a similar list they call it uh, what is it one crl but it's the same idea yep. and they yep. acknowledge that the certificate revocation using ocsp doesn't work so they're going to do a list just like chrome does a list so i guess you know maybe yep. that kind of confirms this is the best way to do it yep do we fix so it? uh at the cansec west security conference over the weekend uh one, I have to say, this guy is gifted. Uh, uh, this is the pwn to own, the pwn to own competition or challenge, which is co-sponsored by HP's Zero Day Initiative and Google's um, Code Zero program. I'm sorry, Project Zero program. Uh, found a bunch of bugs. Uh, Microsoft Windows was found to have five, IE had four, Firefox had three, Adobe Reader, three, Adobe Flash, three, Apple Safari, two, and Chrome, one. Overall, a total of 442500 dollars, 442500 was paid out to researchers. But um, more than half of that was grabbed by one guy. Um, uh, And this is, he's a Korean researcher. Um, Is it what, uh, pronounced Young Hoon Lee? Uh, I guess it's as good as mine on that one. Yeah. Uh, He pulled off, uh, okay, so all of, as I just noted, uh, IE, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, all four browsers collapsed under the pressure from these guys. He was responsible for three of the four. Um, and against Chrome, he won $110,000, which is the single biggest payout in history. Uh, as you mentioned on MacBreak Weekly, he used more than 200 lines of code. This used Chrome... Oh, 2,000. I'm sorry, 2,000. 2,000. 2,000 lines Which is of code. like writing an application. I mean, that's a big well, deal. Well, and, and, and he, he made reference to the, um, the, the Chrome native technology, which I'm going to have to cover on a podcast soon because it's really interesting. I, I, I took a look at it uh, recently relative to uh, exploit mitigation that they're doing. But, but, but this is the technology that is, that is really sort of frightening that allows you to run native x86 code at full machine speed, no interpretation, like, like you know any JavaScript or Java or Flash or anything else has, native code in, in a special uh, sandbox in the browser. So it's very likely that 2,000 lines of this is what he used. So he said, using more than 2,000 lines of code, Lee took down both the stable and the beta versions of Chrome by exploiting, get this, a buffer overflow race condition in the browser. 
He then used an info leak and the race condition in two Windows kernel drivers to get system access. So the the standalone Chrome bug fetched him $75,000. The privilege escalation bug got him another 25000 And then Project Zero, so, so, so that would be 100000 Then Project Zero independently paid him 10000 uh, when Chrome was hacked at that event. So just for Chrome, that the Chrome takedown, 110000 Then <coughs> in IE11, he earned $65,000 for exploiting a 64-bit version. This is IE1164 with what's called a time of Oops. check to time of use. The acronym is T-O-C-T-O-U. Time of check to time of use vulnerability. Who even knew there was such a thing? The vulnerability exploits the time between the, the time a file's property is checked and the time the file is used. This is another one of those little shim sort of things where if you're really good and you really understand this stuff, you can foil the system that designed to be foolproof. Um, and uh, normally, this would lead to a, pri to a privilege escalation, but in this case, uh, the attack enabled him to gain read-write privileges on the browser, while another attack he used allowed him to escape the sandbox via a JavaScript injection, uh, which allowed him to evade other IE11 defensive mechanisms. So again, this is, you know, some serious Aikido, uh, uh, this kind of hacking. And yeah, and almost all of the uh, CanSeg West exploits were cha what they call chained. That's a chained right. exploit, taking advantage of flaw, 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 flaw down the road. That's right, why two thousand lines of code. Yeah, and, and it's because that you know, one one problem will get you a little bit of a beachhead, but nothing you can immediately exploit. So you have to take that and then leverage that into something else to to get a, a you know a more powerful advantage and then do it again i mean it's i, I feel like we're in the land of science fiction now it's just amazing to me that, that this is all true but then anyway finally there in safari he found a use after free vulnerability which exploited an uninitialized stack pointer uh in safari sandbox in order to break out of the sandbox and that earned him fifty thousand dollars so he took home 225 grand for nice. uh, a few minutes worth of, of demonstration as we noted and, and as you have said on, on both of those prior podcasts leo you know these are i mean it, it's a little bit of a mixed blessing because this 2000 lines of code he didn't sit down and write right there you know he had figured out that he was going to be able to crack chrome and in fact uh in some background research i did he did this through static code analysis that is, he sat there looking through code in order to find a way to do this. So, you know, he earned his money. And and um, so I guess I've, I've, I'm glad that these vulnerabilities have been removed. Uh, it certainly does take, you know, this level of skill in, in order to, to find them. They're, they are These vulnerabilities are increasingly difficult to find and exploit. And, of course, that's the good news for all of us. Browsers are getting more secure uh, now the key, as I keep mentioning is for us not to break them by adding stuff to them and so we have a Firefox update coming I, I'm now at 36.0.4 and I was at point three yesterday so they've been revving it a bunch I don't know whether this may already have the the uh, uh, provision for that er erroneous cert or not uh, I mean it's not a huge problem it's it very likely the case that no malicious certificates were minted by this proxy but it is very cool i think that somebody using chrome downstream of the proxy visited google and that just sent chrome into a fit and immediately identified that you know that a, an illegitimate google certificate uh was in use and then we were able to figure that out so this is some cool instrumentation that, uh, that Google has been building. No kidding. And uh, I, I, I loved Sunday's tweet, Leo. I, I just wanted to Thank you. Uh, 
mention that. And I don't remember it. I <laughs> completely agree with you about VR headsets and pornography. <laughs> Have you tried I, it? I watch. No, no, no. But <laughs> and, and I and I and you are right. And I was a little disappointed that, that everybody else was just like in shock when you said that, as if, as if they hadn't even thought of the it, idea. Well, I mean, any student of history and technology knows that for whatever reason, adult entertainment is always on the leading edge of this of, oh, yeah. of new technology. The the very I mean the reason VHS, you know, video cassettes took off initially. It, you know, the adult entertainment was what people were purchasing. And we're probably, everybody listening to this podcast is old enough to remember that in the early days, the internet was mostly porn. Right. I mean, that's what, it was a huge, you know. It may it, still be, people but we were, just know not to go there. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen any in flight forever. But I, but I mean, it used to be on sitcoms and things. I mean, it was a right. massive porn database. That's what it was, and people sort of had a sense of anonymity, and so that made them feel safe. And I actually so, think you know, it's not only not changed; it's gotten that that really is probably a huge amount of the internet traffic. And people just, I think, everybody just kind of pretends it's not the case, and or just well, if nothing it. else, if nothing else, there is a lot more now. Yes. It used to be that you know you you just there wasn't that much else right. on the internet. There's a ton of other now, stuff too. Everything's on the right. internet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but porn guys were the early on. They were, you know, VHS, every new technology, credit card, you know, online charges. I'm sure the very first tin type photographs. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's a picture. Oh. But but my point, uh, I don't know if I want to belabor it, but my point was having tried it now. Uh, uh, somebody uh, VR. who has a uh, Gear VR headset, which is based on Oculus. Um, surfed to one of these sites that offered I didn't we didn't buy anything they had trailers so I looked at the trailers which are explicit and the experience is very realistic it's um, notably more realistic than just watching it on, on a screen on a flat screen and while I haven't really enjoyed the realism of games you get seasick as you're moving and it's moving in a little different and it's just tough um, and, and regular movies don't lend themselves, I think, so well to the idea of you're in the movie. Certainly nothing that yeah, made you know, I mean, like, like um, what was James Cameron, big one, the uh, Avatar. Avatar. It was like, uh, it was in 3D, it was nice. Yeah, but and, VR, you know, the, the idea is that you're not just watching the action on the screen, you can look around, right? So that doesn't, movie makers are not going to be that interested in letting the viewer's no, attention no. wander to there any part are, of the screen. There are they're artists. Yeah. They want to tell. They they want to control your focus. And maybe they'll play with that, but uh, nobody has to date. Well, as it turns out, the uh, I don't want to go into great detail here, but this well, is there, there. Actually, there's no need to. All I wanted to do it. was to, just. I, yeah, I want. I, I just listening to Twit. I thought, what's wrong with you guys? Leo is right. It's obvious that that's going to be. A market for virtual reality headsets. It's more obvious, obvious than you think, Steve, because it's, it's all a light years different experience. <laughs> but it's like you're there. And that is what people it's, want yeah. with porn. Not with many other experiences. Gaming, yes, if they can get it to work, great. But boy, well, they've got it, it now. It, it's a visceral, emotional, yeah. uh, you know, deeply wired into the human psyche thing. Right. And so, yeah, I, I like I immediately understood what you were saying, and I just wanted to say, I that those guys somehow, maybe they were just sh too shy. I mean, you know, we're we're adults. I think they were absorbing it's, it's, it. Just, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm surprised there had there's been nothing written about it. Nobody's talked about it. It happened with Google Gear, um, very quickly, or Google Glass rather, very quickly, that there were attempts to use it. That's yeah, not the same thing. That's just looking over at a window here. over your eyebrow. Yeah. Imagine an immersive adult experience that a lot of people would be very interested in. And um, it, it is not like... It, it, it is it almost... It's just, really convincing. It's That's the convincing. thing this was made for, practically. And why nobody's written about this is beyond me. Because it, uh, I, I feel like this will be a very big part of what makes VR I think it's happen. just... I think it's just too soon. It's, it's just, yeah. you know, we're, you know, they're still showing 3D cubes. 
It's like, oh, look at that 3D cube throw floating in space. It's like, well, yeah. no. I remember going yeah. to SIGGRAPH 15 years ago, 1991 or two, and they had, you you could fly on a pterodactyl. Some of you may remember this. It was a very famous VR demonstration. It required a lot of hardware. Oh, and you're flying. Things. And yeah. as you're flying, you can look around. That's cool. But if you were flying with a naked woman... <laughs> I'm, I don't want to go anymore, but I'm just saying. No need. No need. I just, I, I, you know, I, it, it was just my reaction to them not understanding how obvious. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just if, if nothing else, the history. It's you know, for whatever reason, that that has always been a major application yeah. of leading edge technology. And you and, ain't seen nothing I, yet. That's all I'm saying. It's just beginning. And I, the, the other thing I wanted to mention about Sunday show was it was interesting to listen to Ed Bott defend <laughs> his position on privacy. I give him that opportunity that, every time. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's I mean I, I and and you and I sort of feel similarly, but but that's the sort of that's the feeling that I got when I came out of of that of, of the Snowden movie, uh, Citizen Four, was a, a deeper sense of respect for the rights of people who wanted privacy for its own sake. I really think that that's where Ed is. He's like, he wants it for its own sake. He, he feels like he's, he's always had control. He doesn't want to lose that control. And, uh, you know, it's his right. And I think... Of course you know, it is. Nobody denies that. Right. right. My, and the only point I continue to make is... That a lot of the services you use today, like Google and Facebook, Oops. are paid for. I by did that it again. Data for utility and put my it, name. It, to in me, there. it violates. It's a. It's a. It's an ethical violation. <laughs> and I, by the way, I, I think people think that I'm talking about Twit. I'm not. We don't. We have kind of a different model anyway. But if I get, I guess it'd be the same thing. If you'd never listen to the ads on, on our shows. Um, but loved the shows and listened to the shows every time, that's the same kind of ethical um, uh, violation. You're saying, I'll consume the content, but I will not support the way you pay for it. And that's, you know, that's, it's fine if you don't want to participate, but to don't. But don't, don't well, use Google and Facebook and say, but I don't want to see the ads. Cause although Ed, 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 does, Ed did keep reminding you that it's the tracking that he yeah. objects to. Yeah, and not, the, you don't not, not the ads, but 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 cause, cause, I mean, he really understands the the incredible amount of data that is aggregated yeah. Yeah, about us, and so yeah. that's the thing that that, that he objects. And to. when you Just, watch a show, we don't in any way track whether you saw the ad no. or not. We can't. We wish we could, but we can't. We are. There's no way of us when you get a show knowing anything about you. We don't. So uh, even when you watch live, I mean, there are a few trackers on our site that do for analytics. Because, you know, somebody pointed out, well, you got a Facebook like button on your site, which I think we do somewhere. That's a tracker. Of course, Facebook then is getting a, a bit of data about you, mostly just your IP address and maybe your browser, uh, whatever they can deduce from the browser. Maybe they're well, sending they a super know, cookie. They, they, they know. know where you are. Yeah, because... Yeah. Um, no, your IP because address. The, yeah. Well, no, the, the, they know you're a twit because your HTTP referrer header will say that there's a like button on twit.tv. So, so, you know, yeah. they get it's, it. It's basically giving Facebook a window into our, where we our site. Um, yeah, the, you know, and I should take those, I'll take those buttons off. We won't have them on the new site. Um, we will have analytics because we need to know how many people visit our site. Not for effort, necessarily for advertising reasons, although that's part of it, but we want to know that. Yeah. You know, um, so, you know, if you're using an ad blocker, you're basically saying, yeah, I'm going to steal your stuff. To me. I understand the other issues, the privacy issues, absolutely right on. Just don't visit sites. You can listen to our show. That's safe. Yeah. So, um, just a really short, nice little note from a listener of ours, uh, Phil Horowitz, who's in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. He said, hello, Steve and Leo. A simple everyday spin ride story. <laughs> I was helping a friend who had a Windows 8 computer that hung at startup. He didn't know what to do. So we brought the computer over and I ran spin right. As I have seen before, there were no evident errors that were corrected. But nevertheless, 
After spin right completed, the PC started. Great. Love security now. Haven't missed a show. Phil Horowitz. So, um, and I did want to take this opportunity just to say back to the listeners of this podcast on the occasion of our 500th podcast. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you because um, the the support that I feel from our listeners. I mean, how many times have I read testimonials or tweets from people who have said, uh, I know the only thing you sell is spin right. Um, I bought a copy even though I didn't need it to support you and the podcast. And I, I now know that when a drive crashes that I'd probably be able to recover it and, and save it. And and that means a lot. I mean, it's one thing for people to say, hey, you know, love the podcast. But, you know, when people vote with their with their dollars, uh, that's significant. And and for me, as you know, Leo, you're always mentioning that Sprint uh, as I just said, is the only thing that I sell. Um, the podcast, this podcast, has been one of the best things I've ever done uh, for helping to get the word out about Spinright. Prior to that, the reason I was doing the InfoWorld column back in those early days was that I was able to trade an ad insertion with InfoWorld for my column. Uh, they'd let me let the world know about Spinright. I put a, a column worth of content uh, in there in InfoWorld in Info every week. And so, you know, that worked for me. And, you know, that's, for me, this is the same sort of thing. I love doing the podcast, um, but my ability to, to tell people about Spinright for the last 10 years uh, of the podcast has allowed the word to spread. Uh, it's helped innumerable people who wouldn't have known about Spinrite and would have lost data that they considered vital and important. Uh, and as I often say, it's paid all the bills. It allows me to have Sue and Greg to do the, the back-end bookkeeping and tech support and gives me the freedom to, to push forward on other things. So anyway, I, you know, I, I'm, I hear thanks from our listeners all the time for the podcast, uh, which really means a lot to me. I want to really turn that around and say thank you to our listeners uh, for making this possible for me because you, your support and you guys all do that. Thank you. We do. We agree. Awesome people. Keeping up the, uh, keeping up the content flowing. So, speaking of content, yes. Windows Secure Boot. Um, okay, so um, this will sound familiar because it's very much the same story that any system booting in an in a hostile environment would have. The reason it'll sound okay. familiar is it's the Apple iPhone story. When we did the, the series, I think it was three podcasts on on the, I think it was with iOS 7, all of the things that Apple did in order to really lock down, I mean seriously secure iOS. Um, Have to go a second. That phone in a super hostile environment. Bad guys desperately want to get in. And the, the phone is sitting there all by itself, no one to defend it, it has to defend itself. So, so there's a, a now sort of a well understood approach to this. And it, it, it involves a, a so-called trust anchor that is some absolute, some single point of trust, and the the evolution of what the device does, whether it's a phone, a desktop, a laptop, or whatever, all sort of flows from that that first point of trust. So, the original PC had the BIOS, you know an acronym everyone's familiar with, with basic IO system, B-I-O-S. And it was 
just about as simple as it could be. I, I meant to, to have a copy of it uh, next to me. I, I have the original uh, IBM XT technical reference manual, which is this really nice sort of cloth-bound three little sort of mini three-ring binder, and just innocently printed at the back of this technical reference is the listing of the BIOS, and it was really useful for me. It allowed me to create my first product, for the PC, which was this crazy thing called Flicker Free, where I rewrote the BIOS handler for the display screen. Uh, in order to remove the scrolling flicker that the, the CGA, the color graphics adapter card had, and also sped it up by hundreds of times. It was just amazing what a difference uh, rewriting a chunk of the BIOS could have. And similarly, in the early days of SpinWrite, I, I needed to understand what was in the BIOS in the PC XT in order to, in order to interact with it you know, because I was essentially taking the place of DOS. Well, the idea with the original BIOS was very simple. The, the concept was the BIOS is going to be a layer between the hardware and the operating system so that there, there would be hardware on the motherboard. You'd have serial ports, a parallel port, uh, graphics display, or, or at least a text display, keyboard, uh, in the early days, cassette input and output, um, and uh, floppy drives, and maybe a hard drive. Mm. That's that was pretty much it. That was the I/O of the PC, and and rather than expecting any software that ran on that PC to 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 talk to the physical hardware, what IBM provided was an, an interface layer, um, formerly called a hardware abstraction layer, an HAL, the idea being that no matter what type of disk controller you might plug in, whether it was RLL or SCSI later on or MFM or whatever, you could always talk to different makes and models of hard disk controller through the BIOS interrupt 13 uh, of the BIOS in order just to say, read and write these sectors, move the head, uh, format the track, and so forth. There were commands you could give. Similarly, interrupt 10 was the, the, the video interface. And so you were able to say, you know, clear the screen, print this line of text, and so forth. Well, the problem was, at, as the industry evolved, uh, people wanted to pierce that layer because they wanted additional function. Um, I, I remember, well, for example, I replaced the video portion of the BIOS with a little TSR, a Terminate and Stay Resident Program, flicker free, in order to en dramatically enhance the performance of the screen on that system. But famously, there were things that people started to want to do that you could not do through the BIOS. Uh, uh, I want to say VisiCalc. Was VisiCalc on the PC? Oh, yeah. Or was it Lotus? Well, VisiCalc was, Visi and then Lotus. VisiCalc started on that. Yeah. Right, right. And so in, 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 in Lotus, I remember, um, they, were, they were programming the, the, the video RAM directly because they just couldn't afford the overhead essentially, uh, of, of the BIOS. The BIOS could have allowed them to do it, but the, but the things they wanted to do, scrolling quickly, horizontally and vertically, moving, you know, like highlight bars around the screen, it just couldn't do that. So they had to bypass the BIOS and go direct. So, so many older systems are still BIOS based. The BIOS has, has, has lived for decades, um, mostly because you could bypass it. You, you, you would use the BIOS to, to essentially power the system up. It would initialize the hardware. It would sort of settle things down. Then it would look through a list of, of possible boot devices, um, checking them in sequence for a sector that said it had access to a bootable, bootable partition, and it would go and see if it could boot the partition. If so, it would run that code, and off you'd go. The, the operating system then, 
rather than using the BIOS, but for example, you know, DOS actually did use the BIOS, but, but the first thing Windows did was say, okay, fine, get out of the way. And Windows brought its own drivers essentially to talk directly to the hardware. So, so, th so this was the uh, situation up until probably what, the, the mid 1990s or so, when, when the BIOS began to show its age. Um, systems were evolving. We were beginning to want much more capability. Uh, people wanted to be able to boot their system over the network remotely. They, uh, they wanted, uh, you know, corporate IT wanted to be able to do an inventory of what was plugged into the motherboard without even talking to the operating system. Actually have the motherboard be smart enough. Motherboards started to want to be able to monitor the voltages of their power supplies and the current. They had multiple fans, that, that, and so they wanted to, to control temperature in various areas. They had, you know, fancy RAID arrays that, that they needed to support. Essentially, the, the, the very modest platform that the PC XT originally was, that the BIOS was able to service, that platform just exploded. So we needed something new. And so the so-called EFI um, then became the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, UEFI, which is now the state of the art in firmware. Some people say the UEFI BIOS, although technically that's not right, uh, because the BIOS is the BIOS, and UEFI is a different firmware than the BIOS firmware. Um, but today's UEFI offers a vast array of services. There's, um, there's uh, essentially almost an, an operating system within the motherboard to manage the, the, the modern complexity of all the peripherals. Uh, there's uh, an ACPI, which is the uh, the, the power control that allows uh, various uh, power down states, and all of that has to be communicated and coordinated with the hardware, so that the motherboard is is like understands how to how to do that to all of its hardware. So you you still need a sort of a, a central point of responsibility, uh, and, and as I mentioned, there's you know fans and voltage and current monitoring, <coughs> remote network booting all the chassis management and everything so so the uefi is a has, has just exploded in size it's it's really left the original bios way behind so it got to the point where it was time to talk about security and the UF, uefi has gone through a number of versions it was at 2.2 that we first really got what was known as secure boot. And, and in the same way that the iPhone depends upon its hardware in order to provide absolute security, the secure boot is the same way. There is a, there is a platform key, abbreviated PK, which the manufacturer of the device we'll use the term motherboard just for short but it could be also you know the the, the main board of the laptop or, or whatever there is a there is a platform key which the manufacturer um, is able to use to sign the firmware which first wakes up when when power is applied to the device. So essentially, everything we have learned about the way certificates and public keys and all of the PKI, the public key infrastructure works, that is all there in the UEFI system, in the UEFI uh, system firmware. Um, the, the manufacturer has the private key that it probably doesn't let go of. There are some instances where really large purchasers may acquire 
the, the private key for their systems if, if they want absolute control over the firmware of, of the systems that they're purchasing and, and managing, although it's probably not necessary because of the hierarchical nature, sort of in, in, in the same way that you can get a certificate to secure your server, you don't need to be a certificate authority yourself. So, uh, so essentially, in, in, in the, if we sort of reuse the jargon of the web, the manufacturer of the motherboard, this UEFI motherboard, is the certificate authority, it is the, C, the, the trusted CA for their device, because burned into the ROM of that board, unmodifiable, is a public key which is used to verify the signature of the of the of the the, the first startup boot firmware that wakes up when the system receives power. So the, the, at, at a hardware level, before anything happens, the this the signature, the digital signature, and in, in you know in um, in the sense of a, a, an SHA two fifty six. Mac signature is taken of the very first firmware to start and verified against this platform key. And of course, so what that means is that only signed firmware will be booted by that board. If anything changes, if a byte changes in that firmware or someone, anyone tries to replace the firmware, um, and in fact, there are also rollback provisions so that it's uh, use, using timestamps so that it is not possible to put an earlier version of firmware on top of a later version. So, so the, the system has been designed um, in, the, in very much the same way the iPhone was, <clears throat> with the security framework that, is, that, that starts with, with absolute hardware support and then works to never lose that. There are there are three databases that are contained in non-volatile RAM or ROM. That doesn't really matter. It, it, it is it, it won't lose its its memory when it, when it's powered off, but it can be rewritten. Thus, these are databases. Um, There's something called the KEK, the Key Exchange Key database, which contains essentially signatures, uh, the spec refers to them as trust anchors, but they're just cryptographic signatures of entities that are allowed to modify the other two databases. There's an allowed signatures database and a forbidden database. And either of those databases can contain either certificates that sign other firmware or hashes, that is, uh, you know, digests, fingerprints of other firmware. So, so, so what we have is an architecture where all of the, all of the firmware modules, that is, for example, uh, in, in UEFI, you still have things like option ROMs to extend the, the, the knowledge that the base firmware has of specific peripherals. So a, um, a, a for example, a, a, a network hardware will have its own option ROM with firmware, UEFI compatible firmware in it. In order for that option ROM to be initialized at boot, which has to happen in order to, for it to initialize the network hardware, that option ROM has to either be well first of all it has to be signed and it, it it's the signer of that has to have their their certificate in the allowed signatures database and not have that that certificate in the forbidden database or if there if, if there isn't a certificate for the firmware then the the cryptographic hash of that firmware has to be in the allowed signatures database. So you have an explicit whitelist, blacklist system for every component of UEFI firmware. All the various pieces of, 
of, it, of additional uh, firmware extension that exists on the motherboard are individually hashed and in some cases signed uh, in, in order to allow that firmware to, uh, oh, and, 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 and I should m mention that, that the firmware is enumerated when the, when the system powers up and then that, that initially signature protected uh, initial boot code goes out and checks the signatures of all of the other pieces of firmware. As it's doing this, it's also leaving an audit trail. There's another component of this, which is it's, it's oddly named. It's called measured boot. So we have secure boot, which is sort of the, <coughs> the, the, the implementation side of making sure that nothing that is known bad or unknown is ever allowed to run. And then the measured boot is an auditing system, an auditing function, which is going on throughout this entire process in the background, which uses the trusted platform module as its audit store, because, because in a compromised system, you, you, the, the compromising software could alter the audit trail. You know, we often hear, for example, how guys get into the system and then erase the logs of them getting in in order to cover their tracks. So, so you, you want to prevent something like that from happening. So, so this measured boot is also running step by step through the entire boot process, creating a, a, essentially an audit trail of everything that is run. So at some point, after all of the UEFI firmware has been enumerated, all of the, uh, all of the separate pieces of it have had their signatures checked, certificates have either been found for them or they are, they are, they are explicitly whitelisted in the allowed signatures database. Finally then, the system will, will enumerate uh, boot candidates and for, you go up. for you know, like mass storage boot candidates and begin to turn this boot system over to the operating system that wants to run on top of all of this. So that's where, of course, Windows comes along. Um, Windows is able to to have, uh, as, as, well, first of all, uh, first of all, as we know, 64-bit uh, kernel drivers have to be digitally signed. So the the um, the UEFI firmware is able to reach up into the Windows bootloader, which is a an EFI image. Also, uh, EFI images are um, Microsoft format uh, portable executable files, um, and that's just a, 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 a standard for UEFI. Um, so UEFI is able to reach up, verify in the same way that it, that it verifies its own firmware, it's able to verify the, the first boot modules of the operating system also to make sure that that they are explicitly whitelisted and that they have not been changed. Then Windows introduces, um, the, the, the operating system itself has this notion of boot drivers, which are, which are kernel drivers flagged for early loading. It, it's just a, a, a particular property that, that the driver has in its header, which, which says, I need to be loaded early in the process. There's a special one of those for that supports Windows Secure Boot, uh, which is called ELAM, E L A M, which is um, the early launch anti malware. So, and and Microsoft uses the acronym A M for anti malware throughout their 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 spec of this. So the idea is that that the <laughs> EFI, the UEFI firmware verifies the signature on these drivers. Um, the drivers are signed by Microsoft Authenticode. So, and that technology is also available to the UEFI firmware. It's able to verify Microsoft Authenticode signatures um, in order to, to know that it's able to trust these pieces. This ELAM, the early launch anti-malware gets in, inserts itself into the, the, the boot process and then 
essentially takes over responsibility. That's the handoff between the UEFI and, and the Microsoft boot process where Microsoft is now able to know that, that up to the point that it has received control, only signed and trusted modules from, from the first moment power started to flow through the motherboard to now um, have been able to operate. Uh, Microsoft, um, my, Microsoft's own boot system then pulls in the balance of the pieces of Windows, verifying every piece of the, and also doing anti-malware checking against various types of dictionaries that it, it, it has available as this progresses. Um, and uh, the, the final thing it does is it looks in the trusted platform module for this measured boot audit and it has the ability to send that out of the machine to a remote server where that audit is verified. It understands that if something has gone wrong, it can't be trusted to audit itself. But, it, but the, the TPM is able to produce its own signed audit trail, which cannot be altered. So that can be sent out to a third party um, in order to verify the security of the boot. And so, for example, there, there's another term, trusted boot, which technically is the, is, the, is the combination of a secure boot and an audited boot, or, you know, which is this measured boot technology. Together, they allow Windows to get itself up and going in, in a trusted state. And for example, it might be in a, in a large enterprise that that computer is not allowed onto the network until that measured boot, that is the audit, has been verified by some other machine on the network, uh, confirmed that this system is up in full trusted mode. Every, every piece of it that has run so far is, is trusted. There's no malware present. And then the machine is given permission to get on to the corporate network. So, so essentially, what we've got is a uh, rather straightforward, although it is really complex. The the specification, uh, I was looking at that it's um, at now at two point four errata when, level. When key, one he is, he is Steve. Is a three thousand page. It was two thousand nine hundred and ninety eight. One understands why it sometimes can be so hard to get stuff to run. This, you know, it's Probably. everybody got their features in, and the fact is, oh, I mean, the computer. UEFI is like a world unto itself. It is a whole operating system. There's a command language. You can issue commands. You can get consoles. I mean, just it, it's amazingly sophisticated. Basically, all we normally see is you know we turn the computer on and it boots our operating system. All of this stuff goes on hidden in the background. So, so. You can now, you can understand, I mean, un understanding what this is, we can imagine what it means if you <coughs> not turn it off. Because if you own a computer and there is no way to turn this off, to turn off secure okay. boot, then you have an appliance. You can't, um, if you can't change the operating system, you can't um, mess around with the computer at all. It is, it is, I mean, you can, you can do things crazy, that it yes. allows you to do, but nothing that it doesn't. Because from the first moment this thing receives power, everything has to be signed and trusted. Now, this is why, um, because this was sort of a controversial move, why the Windows 8 logo requirements, as I mentioned before, explicitly said that secure boot must be enabled when a new machine is shipped, but it must be possible for the user to manually disable. I, I, I should also mention that um, there is a, a post-boot programmatic interface 
between the operating system and the UEFI. That is to say, UEFI exposes a, a large array of services for managing all of these trust databases, which Windows, for example, knows how to talk to. So, and that's necessary. For example, when we're updating kernel drivers, that's, um, uh, they're probably going to all be signed by Microsoft certificate, so they would be trusted anyway. But you, you might have a, a, for example, a third-party driver, which Microsoft needs to bless, um, and for example, put its signature into the, the trusted UEFI database when, it, when Microsoft installs that driver into Windows. So, or, or at least Microsoft wants to verify that this driver that it, it has installed into itself to be booted will be trusted by UEFI at boot time so that UEFI will allow that driver to load. So there has to be a post-boot interaction between the operating system and basically the crossing guard, you know, the, 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 the guard at the bridge which is, is sitting there deciding who gets to run or not. So the controversy um, is that whereas with Windows 8, Microsoft said systems must be allowed to allow the user to turn that off. And, that, and that's the key. No, pro, you, you cannot programmatically turn it off. There, there has to be no way for malware to turn it off because that's what you know programmatic means is that a malware could flip that switch that caused the system to get rebooted and then gain a, an early foothold. Basically, what we're doing is presenting, we're preventing any kind of, of firmware hack or, or bootkit or rootkit style exploit, which is, is, has always been the Achilles heel. Uh, you know, um, we've, we've talked about how the operating system can't be responsible for what happens before it gets in control. It could do the best job it can to prevent anything bad from happening once it's in control, but before it's in control, it's not there. So if something is able to modify it before it runs, then it's already corrupted by the time it becomes aware and, and is able to operate. So th this whole system is about, is about preventing uh, messing with the firmware and messing with the system, up uh, the operating system, as it loads up to the point where it's then able to do the best job it can Oops. of assuming responsibility uh, for anything this that happens. This wires so are old. And, and the, the, the Everywhere. is how the systems are going to look. The Windows 10 logo certified machines where Microsoft has specifically said OEMs can choose whether to allow users to disable secure boot or not. If if that option does not exist in the BIOS, then then essentially you are you, you've got Microsoft Windows installed. That's it. And that's it, baby. But I think there's upgrade. a I think that, that it's nice that you have the choice. So you don't have to buy that. You should find out if it if it, if it's if the OEM right. is doing that. Right. It is completely appropriate that people should be able to buy a machine that is locked down. You know, I think about the Chromebook Pixel, which is Google's yes. thing. Now, they're not using UEFI, they're using uh, Coreboot, which is an open source. Yep, yep. And actually, someday I'd love to hear what you think of that compared to UEFI. But in the Chromebook, they have a very, I think, a nice solution. You can disable it. You have to reboot it to developer mode. It puts a big thing up that says this, you know, you're now gonna be running, able to run unsigned software. Good. But if you wanna do that, you know, but if you want to back out, press the space bar. So for most unsophisticated users, it will always be, and they have a TPM module in there. It is secure. It's signed. They've made it a very, I think, I'm not an expert. I'd love to no, get your opinion I, on that, but a I, very secure I, platform. What you described in terms of the user experience, yeah. I think is exactly right. You, you, I would opt for, I mean, absolutely have this thing be secure. But something feels, I don't know, a little creepy. You bought the hardware. You should be able yes. to modify it. That's what it is, yeah. exactly. It's like, I, you know, I can't do anything else with this. It's like, right. you know, it's like, eh. I mean, it does turn it into a big phone. 
essentially that I can't you right. know, do anything right. with. I was like, you know, we see the need for it. We talk about it every day on the show. Yes, yes, and and for a lot of people, for a lot of people, I, I love the idea that we've got this level of security. Um, most people can't even get into the BIOS. They don't know where it is. Right. They, right. I mean, I have a hard time. Is, is it delete or is it yeah, F2? They change or like, it, they? It, it's difficult to get in. So, so it's already hard enough. And if if they simply say, you almost certainly never want to turn this off. I mean, put up a flashing red screen and say, you know, you know, if you turn this off, we're no longer responsible. We're going to find out you did, and you no longer get support. It's like you're on your own. I, I think that's the way to do it. But it'll be interesting to see. Now, I'm wondering politically what's going on. Do you think this is OEMs asking Microsoft, please don't require us to allow the end user to disable secure boot because some of our customers have on Windows 8, and they've gotten themselves in trouble. We really don't want to have to do that. Or is it Microsoft saying, eh, Linux, I uh, don't think you need Linux. I'm pretty sure it's Microsoft. You, I think you nailed it at the beginning where you say Microsoft eases Jesus. into these things. <coughs> and they kind of telegraphed this. And you may remember when Windows 8 came out, there were a lot of Linux enthusiasts saying, oh, my God, this is terrible. They found out the you, could dis yeah, you could disable UEFI. You can put Linux on these machines. But that, I believe, was Microsoft announcing the world. They were going in this direction. And I, I don't think it's... I don't disagree with it, um, be, because as long as some OEMs offer machines that you can put Linux on, but well, the problem any, is somebody any, any system or anything where else you're right. going to, any system where you're going to install the operating system, right? It's going to be UEFI today, and it'll have that option, right? And and it has and, to be. and then right, and if you install Windows 10, it'll I'm sure Windows will say, hey. Turn on secure boot. Everything's set. Right. The, the databases are established. All the trust anchors are in place. Turn on secure boot, and you and you get to have your system locked down. You don't have to worry about root kits and boot kits and, and firmware. Well, right. exactly, exactly. And as we live in this world of increasing threat, I think the yeah. mass the mass of the market is very much interested in that as a solution, and is never going to install some other operating system. They never well, they didn't install Windows well, in the first place. No, just give us a choice for yeah. in those but for us yeah. yes and that's I have to say one of the things I really like about um, the Chromebook Pixel you can install Linux on it uh, nice. and but you have to go put it in this insecure boot mode and then they're very clear about what you're doing and if you're smart enough to do it and you know the commands then do it uh, now it's, it's funny I run it in, I for a while I put Crouton on it in Linux and, you know I don't need that I, it's just messing it up I'm just I want to I want to know crouton? that this is, it's called Crouton, because it's a Chirut, it's a chir, it, it's a uh, CH right, root right. script, it turns on a CH root virtual machine, and then you put right. Linux in it, it's a, it's like a very elegant actually, it's a clever yeah. hack, I mean, elegant may not be the right word, it's a clever hack, but um, I like the idea that when I'm using the Pixel, I know exactly what it does, it's absolutely secure, I now, just don't have to think about it. It's, it's worth noting also that even though this would give Richard Stallman oh, a seizure, a seizure, he hated in every uh, form. Oh my lord! Um, it is possible to to do certificated drivers with Linux. Right. So so it it is often possible to to still be in a non Windows OS and use Secure Boot. Uh, you just have to go through the, the extra effort of, of getting stuff signed and certificates installed, but uh, entirely possible. And by the way, I'm told in the chat room, and I believe this is true, that uh, do uh, Stallman does endorse Chrome, Chrome Boot because that is an open source uh, free SF, FSF uh, program. Um, what about SpinWrite? If I have a, the way I use SpinWrite right now, I boot to a new operating system. Correct. Free DOS. Correct. What are you going to yeah, do about so, that? Um, so, uh, if it turns out that we that we do we are we end up in a world where we're in secure boot, then I'll just do a version of Spinrite as a kernel driver because 
I've, that's something I've always been I've always been thinking about, right. and that that would allow it to run because I have an authentic code. You know, all all of my software is signed by Microsoft authentic code. I, it's all you know Gibson Research Corporation, and we're trusted, and so I'm able to do kernel drivers, uh, and a kernel driver has all the capability that I would need. So you know, it may be that that'll end up being an, another piece of spin right that comes comes along uh, if it turns out that there are people who need spin right to run in a secure boot environment. It does mean that somebody's saying in the chat room, I think this is true, used hardware has reduced value. It, you know, remember this one of the solutions to running an old XP machine was uh, put Linux on it. Well, that won't be an option on old Windows 10 machines in many cases. Uh, right, well, it makes and, it more and, disposable. And, 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 and relative to um, the spin right, remember that the, the story I just read, Phil Horowitz's uh, friend uh, had a Windows 8 computer that was hanging at startup. If that was a Windows 8 computer, yeah, it probably it had secure boot. He turned that off, and then he booted spin right, and it worked just fine. Uh, I presume the system recovery boots would still work. Oh, yeah. In fact, there's a there, there's some fancy stuff Microsoft does. If it... I mean, it has all this sort of this multi-level fallback stuff where if it gets to the point that it thinks it's okay and it looks back at that measured boot audit and sees something fishy, it's able to immediately abort its own boot and fall back to recovery mode in order to, like, restore drivers and, and things. So there's all of this, you know, magic, <laughs> magic scary stuff going on that... You know that we hope works right. Although you know, it seems like sometimes that stuff has a problem too. It's only a matter of time before somebody figures out something. Yeah. So essentially, we've 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 seen the evolution of our hardware platforms um, along the same line that we followed Apple with the iPhone, where in order to in order to put up the the level of 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 resistance. To hacking that we really have to have in this day and age, uh, the system has no choice but to essentially whitelist every component that it's going to load. And if you're going to whitelist every component, then then you're going to be rigid against non-whitelisted components or operating systems. It's, I love this show. You learn so much from this show. If you are, enjoy it, I do hope you will listen each and every week. Subscribe. That's the best thing to do. And uh, you can do that at uh, twit.tv slash SN or using your podcatcher uh, or iTunes or whatever you use to listen. Almost all of them will have a subscribe option. Uh, you can also uh, listen through our uh, great third-party apps. We have wonderful developers on iOS, Android, Windows Phone, Roku, uh, I, I bet you there's BlackBerry, there's certainly Windows and Mac, that you can always do it that way too. But uh, please make sure you tune in every Wednesday about 1.30 Pacific Daylight Time. I say that because I think there's still a, some error in our calendar on the website, and I want you to understand we've moved to Daylight Time. In uh, We've also moved to Tuesday, so... Did I say Wednesday? <laughs> One of these days. It's only been six months. Tuesday, thank you. Um, and so... Uh, that is uh, 1.30 Pacific Daylight Time, 4.30 Eastern Daylight Time. If you're on UTC, that's 20.30, or you can make the calculations yourself. Most other countries are going to summertime soon, I think, so this won't be as much of an issue. There's just this little interregnum that's a problem. Uh, you can get Steve's got 16 kilobit versions of uh, the audio at his site, as well as full ten text transcripts that are great. That's grc.com. We'll also find the world's finest hard drive and maintenance utility. Plus lots of other freebies. Steve's giving stuff away all the time. You heard? Did you hear a conversation? Uh, was yes. it on Twit about about uh, Microsoft's new uh, passport uh, and hello? I, and I and I appreciated your little mention of Squirrel. You said, well, you know, Steve's got this Squirrel thing he's working on, and uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Microsoft supporting Fido. Yeah. Um, We'll see how that goes. There's a lot of problems with FIDO. For example, uh, FIDO doesn't have any uh, identity management at all. That is to say, if so, if so, if your identity escapes from you with FIDO, uh, there's nothing. There, there's no mechanism in FIDO for remediating it, for for recovering it, for pulling it back. Uh, 
all of that is built into Squirrel. So uh, this is why uh, you know Brad Hill, who was one of the chief architects of Fido, said he thought Squirrel was the best thought out system that he had seen. So, but again, you're right. It, it doesn't have everybody behind it. Um, but it does have a lot of small guys behind it. A lot. Of, I, I'm getting people getting email from people saying we want to support it on our website. We we want to use it here or there. Uh, all the various platforms are going to be supported. We'll have Squirrel clients available, and we'll just see. It it might very well live side by side. I, I would have no problem with that at all. Yeah. And, and for one thing, Fido is all based on hardware. I mean, you know, for example, right. um, the you you guys were talking about, and I really like the idea that you need this 3D vision in order that, that, that a photograph won't fool your face recognition in Windows. It actually needs to be a, a 3D representation taken from multiple angles at the same time to know that you're not uh, putting a flat picture up in front of it in order to cause someone to be able to log in. So you know, all of the biometric stuff is part of the FIDO spec. and. And one of the advantages is that Squirrel doesn't require any hardware. You're able to have a software-only client, which is absolutely secure, so it's also free. And you can add it to existing systems. For example, none of the hardware right now that, that, that Windows 10 uh, will run on is, is currently available. You don't have 3D cameras unless you add that. So anyway, we'll, we'll see. I, you know, I'm going to get it done. I'll get back to working on Spinrite 6.1, and we'll we'll uh, give Squirrel a good launch and, and see how it takes off. Find out more about Squirrel at his website. Uh, questions next week, you think? Yep, let's do a Q&A. GRC.com slash feedback. Don't, I'm going to, I suspect Steve's going to say this, but I'll, you correct me if I'm wrong. Don't put birthday greetings there. Yeah, there's no need. I, we all know that I, we all know that I'm getting old. I don't, I Whatever. just, I think that, that you probably would not like hundreds of those. Is there somewhere, should people tweet you if they want to say happy birthday? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That right. would be very nice. It's a big yeah. six zero for Steve Gibson. <laughs> at S-G-G-R-C. GRC.com slash feedback if you've got questions for next week. Yeah, um, and you know, I could see us going to a thousand episodes. Because, you know, this, this last ten years, it's been, it, it's, it's been good, Leo. I don't know about ten, I don't know about, yeah, I can give you about ten more, too. I'm we'll both good. be we'll both be almost seventy. <laughs> It'll be. I, I do think that I do think that Cornell is probably you know on his last legs. He was a. Uh, he's in his eighties, late eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is he really? I don't know exactly how old he is. He's, he's got so much wisdom. I love I love Jerry's wisdom, Jerry. But boy, he he's, he's been battling. Poor guy. Yeah. But you know what? He's doing fine. He got back from the stroke. He was on Twit a couple of weeks ago. It was fabulous. Yeah. I, the mind continues. It's the body that falters. <laughs> right. If you're lucky. Or lucky. <laughs> I don't know. GRC.com. Thank you, Steve. We'll see you next week right here on Security Now. Thanks, Leo. Get, take, keep taking the give go Biloba or whatever. Uh, <laughs> number number 500, 500 in the can. Yeah. Nice. In nice. the can. Okay, my friend. People are saying, did you have an announcement? Because you implied not last week that you'd have an announcement this week. Oh, no, it was it was just my wanting to talk, uh, to say thanks. That was it. That, that, that's, that, that, was, that, that was what I had, uh, what I, I intended to say. I wanted to say thanks back to our listeners, because I get so much thanks from them. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you, Steve. Okay, buddy. Grateful for everything you do. We'll see you next week. It's a pleasure. Bye. Talk to you soon. They say that the, the, the uh, title for episode 1000 will be, Get Off My Land! This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 500, recorded Tuesday, March 24th, 2015, Windows Secure Boot. Security Now is brought to you by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get five bucks off your first purchase by entering the code SECURE. <clears throat> I don't know if it's okay to broadcast his advertisement, but...
I don't have anything against it, but... The guy has to pay his rent with something. And all of you, what you see on Twitter is free, so... That's this and that is an amazing place in my book. Good stop every single day. Sometime when Steve Gibson goes on, and you have to have your propeller hats on. But you will learn a lot anyway, because that guy really knows his stuff. goes into depth on everything. Time to meerkat. Jimmy Fallon's beating you, boo dude. You might as well concede. He's kind of raced past you. What's your tweet say? Long line of losers. That's a good tweet. I like it. <laughs> oh, he's going to kill everybody. He's Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, that's the problem because he immediately gets thousands of viewers. He's broken through the Meerkat 999. I was the first to get stuck in 999. And the last. And yes, let's show this video. I wish I'd had this video on Sunday when we were talking about this. Um, I don't think this is unsafe for work. You have freezed your credit report. Dollars for ten, the other two were free. So is it? It's permanent, or does it re expi expires? Does it have to a few months or something? What's the deal? What's the deal? Oh yeah, this is. Watch senior. Watch senior citizens experience virtual reality porn for the first time. I think that's all we need to see right there. <laughs> oh my God. 
blurred. I love Jimmy Fallon. I don't care if he beat Jeff at Meerkat. <sighs> you pay to lock, you pay to unlock, but it stays locked. I guess it would then stay locked, because I'm not paying him to unlock it. It's permanent until you change it. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that really doesn't say anything, is it? Well, it could, it could change itself. Mm, that's not her knees. Well, I, uh, you guys got anything you want to put in reruns? Schwit, a schwit bit. We used to do uh, before you buy. Go ahead, take it away. I'll release this guy. Okay, it's all. What's important? Duties. He said, say thank you for the company. With Neo and Prince. Careful not to squeeze it.
It's difficult when you have <coughs> stick twigs sticking out everywhere and then you and you focus on one stick and put your fingers in and then you don't see another one and put your nails in that one. So Sorry. Oops. Yeah. 
You have to have an eye on every finger. And that switch is also close.
To let it rest a little. Now it's starting to be like chewing them. And that's not what we want. Oh. <coughs> But I think I will say thank you for tonight and thank you for watching. <laughs>